Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another masterclass. Today, we are going to be chatting with Preston Green, and we're going to be diving in deep on topics about program design for performance, specifically for athletes. And I mentioned this earlier for those who joined the masterclass before I started recording, is we have we have yet to do a presentation and educational course on you know coaching athletes. And as you guys know, coaching gen pop and coaching physique coaching, they're very different. And we throw into the ballpark coaching athletes and athletes is very coaching athletes is very specific to their performance for the specific sports that they play. So Preston is going to take the lead and introduce himself and why he is the one who is the best to be talking about this. Preston. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to be a part of this. I'm honored that um, you guys have asked me to present and to lecture and, and tell you my story dive into some theory methodology and kind of explain how to increase athletic performance, but beyond that, what it takes to actually become a professional strength coach. So this is my 27th year of, of coaching athletes working at a university setting. I started at Clemson University when I was 17 years uh, of age. Then I did my master's degree at the University of, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Then I became uh, the head assistant associate director at the University of Arizona. And then I became the youngest director in NCAA sport at a division one institution. I became the head strength conditioning coach at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Five years later, uh, I took the head basketball strength conditioning job at Stanford University. And then ironically, my alma mater called and um, I went back to Clemson University and uh, was the basketball strength coach there. And then I progressed down to <laughs> more and uh, I was the basketball strength coach at the University of Florida, the Florida Gators for 11 seasons. And uh, I was a part of the final four and four elite eights. And uh, previously now I became the head basketball strength coach at the University of, of Miami. So 27 years has taken me all over the country, but each experience has brought different uh, insight and opportunities and so forth. And, and uh, has really helped me evolve as a coach of teaching different athletes of different sports, learning different personalities, learning different styles of coaching. But beyond that, it's really helped me grow as a coach because when you're a strength coach, you are not just in charge of the team. You work yeah. for a head and every head coach has different expectations. They have different personalities, different demands. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later on. So that's the short version of, of myself. But, uh, but yes, I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. And uh, Whoa. I had five teams on my own uh, at the ACC level, which is a very high level uh, in, in university in the United States uh, when I was 18 years old. So there we go. That's great. That's impressive in itself. And as you guys can see, when it comes to expertise and experience, Preston is the one to be talking about everything. And Preston, real quick question before we dive into our other Q&A questions is, when did you know that you wanted to become a strength and conditioning co a coach? Was there a turning point or someone that inspired you? How did you know that you wanted to get into coaching and, you know, making your way into coaching, you know, pro athletes, even though, you know, college gate athletes are pro athletes. How did you manage to get your foot in the door and knowing that you wanted to do that? Sure. That's a great question. And uh, I've told this story many, many, many times and it never gets old telling this because I think it's really important. Um, to give respect uh, to where credit is due because I wouldn't have had the success or be where I am today if it weren't for my late mentor, Charles Poliquin. So when I was 14 years old, and this was way before the internet, there was no Google, there was like no computers. And uh, <laughs> I used to love going to the library and reading books. And I knew at age 14 that I wanted to coach. I wanted to um, do something along the lines with weightlifting, yeah. lifting weight, whatever it may be. So I went to the library and that was, there's this thing called the Dewey Decimal System. You had to pull the drawer out of the yeah. library, look through the cards and so forth. And uh, I came across uh, this journal, it was the Australian Journal of Sport. Uh, I think it, it was written in 1984. And uh, 
It was an article on theory and methodology of strength training, and it was by Charles Poliquin. So I said, oh, okay. So I'm reading this stuff, and I just had this epiphany, and it clicked. And I'm like, wow, like this is a really cool way of, of strength training, of like lifting weights. So I started trying it out, and there was three numbers back then, and it was like, three zero one. And that's, uh, when I first learned about tempo and uh, so I started doing that. And and so I said, I want to read everything that this guy has written. And, uh, so I just became obsessed with it and got my hands on all kinds of stuff. And, uh, when I was 16 years old, I got his home phone number. And so I called him up and I said, Hey, Coach Pollockman, my name's Preston Green. before I could finish my sentence, he hung, he hung the phone up. And uh, so I got the nerve up, called him a couple of days later. That's when my relationship, he actually said something else, but I won't verbalize it over this. But uh, that's when my relationship with him first started. And uh, I just started following him then. And then I attended my first in-person seminar with him um, when I was uh, uh, 18 years old. And so I just uh, studied everything. And so... I've always been uh, labeled as the Paul Oakland guy of sport, but I have no problem saying that 99% of what I do is, is his methodology. So I basically tried to take his strength training principles uh, yeah. and apply it to basketball. Yeah. So, and we're going to talk trained, about, yeah, we're going to be talking yeah, a I've lot trained, about program design as well, which yeah. is exciting. Um, sorry, there's a little lag yeah. and overlay. I'm not sure if you can hear me well. We're good? Yep, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, just a little delay. So yep. apologies for our students if there is an overlap. I will try to pause longer so that we're not overlapping uh, when we are chatting. But we're going to dive right into our first question because we have a lot to cover today. So when it comes, we're going to start off with program design for improving athletes' performance. So when we're talking about strength training, and that is one of the keys to your program design, why is strength training important for athletes, like a basketball player or a soccer player? Why would strength training be reflective of their performance when they are actually playing the sport? Sure, that, that's, that's a really uh, detailed question. So I would like to first start by, by saying the number one goal of, of being a strength coach with your athlete it's beyond just getting them strong. Any Anyone can get anyone strong. That's easy. But uh, you have to look at the athlete as a whole and say, okay, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And number one is injury prevention. Yeah. Because you're training an athlete and they're not a weightlifter. All they care about is playing time in their sport. That's their craft. That's what they do. All they care about is, 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 is playing their sport. And if they're injured, they can't play. Yeah. If you're a professional athlete, you play, you're going to lose money, uh, your contract, so forth in college. If, you, if you're injured, you can't play, you're going to list, miss out on opportunities to, um, to brand yourself and, and show the world what you can do and get to that next level. So uh, yeah. the reason uh, of what we do is, is to prevent injuries and injury is going to happen in sport. You yeah. can't prevent everything, but at the same time with that, you can do a lot to balance the individual out from a strength standpoint from a, a mobility standpoint, um, you can increase speed, you can increase jumping, all that type of stuff. So in sport, we know that the fastest athlete wins, like no matter yeah. what. doesn't matter how strong you are, the fastest athlete is always going to win, correct? Yeah. But that leads to the question of, well, how do you increase speed? And, and we can get into a little bit more detail later on, but you have to get stronger to get yeah. faster. So a lot of different moving parts like that, but um, you have to look at the athlete and say, okay, we're going to train you to balance you out from a strength standpoint, structural balance and things like that to prevent yep. injuries. But also, how can we improve your performance? Because in basketball or whatever sport, you can't jump too high. You can't run too fast. You can't be too well conditioned. You can't be too strong. Um, but beyond just getting stronger, you have to think of it in terms of like, an engine. You have to increase the athlete's uh, uh, power output and work capacity. Yep. So it's like your car. If you have a, a four cylinder, and that's when you first get your hands on the athlete, you want to turn them into a V12, right? You want yeah. to 
that guy a bigger engine so he can produce more force and, and velocity and things like that. So, but there's another aspect that's really changed and this didn't exist 15, 20, 25 years ago, but your job as a strength coach now <laughs> isn't just to prevent injuries. It isn't just to get them stronger. It isn't just to get them faster. You're also there as a strength coach with athletes, believe it or not, for mental health. Yes. You're there to, to instill confidence, instill positive energy, because um, yep. these athletes in today's world are so, ex they, it's external motivation. It's Instagram, it's a quote of the day, and it's just, it's become, they become so numb to this. And so I look at my players and say, okay, what can we do to intrinsically motivate you? But yeah. like, you need to wake up every day wanting to get better. I tell my players, like, look, it's not just my job to make you better. You need to make me better. Yeah. You know, you need to, and so there's a lot of uh, different dynamics now that exist of like, why, why uh, you're a strength coach. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to, you know, welcoming an app, like an athlete, when you first meet an athlete, you're going to be working with. Talk to us a little bit about your process from taking that athlete and knowing what needs improvement and how, what you're going to be programming. So a little bit more about how you're assessing your athletes before starting the program design. Sure. Well, the first thing that needs to be accomplished is you have to cultivate some sort of relationship with the player. Yeah. Because today's athletes, you know, they've been playing their certain sports since age four and they play it year round. Um, there's a lot of uh, noise going into them of expectations and pressure. And with that comes a lot of uh, trust issues and disappointment. So when I first, you know, my incoming freshmen come in on campus in late June or whatever, I've met them a little bit. I've talked to them on the phone, I haven't trained them yet, but I, I want to know about them. I want to know about their families, who they are, what motivates them, what are their goals, just, just trying to have some sort of, 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 of uh, relationship, not a friendship because I'm a coach, but I need them to be able uh, to trust me and know that I'm here to make you better. I want nothing from you. <laughs> and I could write the most magnificent 52 week program. And it's not going to matter if you don't buy in on a consistent level and want to execute that each and every day at a high level. And for that yeah. to be uh, accomplished, there has to be a level of trust and relationship. So I want to get to know my player on, on a little bit of a personal level. Um, yeah. Anyways, that happens. And then it's day one is it's okay. I'm going to assess you from head to toe so I can get some information on you. And so I can write your first two or three week walk. Um, I used to assess for like two hours of like just little nitpicky, crazy, crazy stuff. And what I found over time is all these athletes have the same dysfunction for the most, most part. It's anchor mobility, uh, you know, weak knee flexors, weak low back, tight T-spine. It's the same stuff over and over and over. So I've really shortened my assessment. Um, but when you're assessing an athlete, you basically need to assess body composition. Yeah. You need to test power. And for me, it's uh, different variations of the vertical jump. And then you need to test strength. Um, when I'm testing an athlete in strength, I will test uh, in the close grip bench press. I will test reps and uh, 1RM in the supinated chin up. And I will test uh, external rotation, single arm, elbow on the knee. I've really seen gotcha. why. Um, I do not test strength in the lower body anymore because none of them can squat correctly. Like they don't have the mobility. They don't have the technique. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'll keep that simple. Um, I will do some different lower body uh, mobility assessments. I'll do a length tension test. I'm looking for specific degrees of the hamstrings, the, yeah. the sagittal, the medial, and the lateral. I look for ratios of that. Um, and I will do the clat test, jumping off a of box, looking for uh, BMO, adductor tightness, hamstring weakness, things like that. So I'll assess them from that standpoint. And, and then obviously body composition, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I've really, really simplified that quite a bit. Yeah. And do you think that the athletes that come to you, especially since you work with college athletes, do you think a lot of these weaknesses come 
from the level of knowledge that high school coaches hold and how high school coaches train their athletes? Or do you just think that that is an overall weakness, especially coming from, you know, a younger age going into adulthood, that that's something that they need to focus on, on improving. And I asked this question because we do have some coaches that may be coaching younger athletes and that can, they can use that as, you know, their superpower to know, Hey, how can I, you know, provide this athlete with everything they need to know so that when they do enter that college level uh, of playing, they don't have that as a larger weakness, as you stated, how most of your athletes, when you start working with them, you can pinpoint that it's pretty similar. Sure. You know, there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, spectrum and continuum on good training and bad training throughout uh, middle school and the high school level and things like that. Some high school programs have really, really, really good um, strength training programs, just yeah. mastering the basics, teaching them how to overhead press correctly, teaching them how to squat correctly, good form, good technique. Uh, there's some programs, which is just frightening and horrific. It's, they, they, it's, yeah. it's, it's intensity, low, 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 the heaviest weight, bad form, whatever. And then there's some programs where none of it exists. So when I yeah. have new players, Sometimes I have guys with zero background, bad form, bad technique, and very rarely, you know, once in a while you have someone with a good. So there's, a, there's quite a mix of that. But the problem is, is what I said earlier is sport has become so specialized. You know, back when I was growing up, I played five different sports. You know, it was every season. Baseball was in season and football was in yep. season, and basketball and things like that. Well, these athletes have specialized in such a young age because they all want the scholarship to get into university or they think they're the next pro in this in this sport or whatever it may be and so the the, the downside of that is is they don't get the uh, the multi-directional and nervous system development that we used to uh, but they are creating pattern overload syndrome by doing the yeah. same you know repetition you know over and over and over since age four uh, yeah. or whatever it may be. And that's causing a lot of dysfunction. And I think that's important to mention because from a strength coaching point of view, 15 years ago or whatever, when incoming players came in, they were, you know, weak, but they were pretty healthy. They didn't have ACL tears at that time, hamstring trains, uh, strains, the, their ankles weren't like crowbars that wouldn't bend, like these dysfunctions didn't exist at the level that they do now. And so what's changed now as, as, as a strength coach, which is, you know, uh, an important segue to structural balance and, and things like that, uh, is these guys or girls are broken before they even get to us when they're 18 years old. Yeah. And so you've, I've really had a change with my program design of, of taking a step back and spending more time in general prep, uh, GPP, general prep phases, um, achieving structural balance, a lot more unilateral work for more extended period of time uh, and yeah. so forth. So if you wanted me to quantify it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you spent, you know, 30 to 40% of your time in GPP and 60 to 70% in specific uh, prep phases where now it's like 50, 50. Like yeah. you're, you're rehabbing the athlete when they're 18 years old before you've even started training them. So I think that it's not so much the, the training that has occurred in high school or, or middle school. It's, it's becoming, uh, you know, specific and choosing a sport and playing it year round, yeah. you know, cause these high school basketball players play high school and they play AAU or their circuit, things like that. They, they never get a break like ever. Yeah. They're, they're playing they year think round. That that's doing them a benefit where in fact, it's actually causing more harm and kind of segues into our question about, you know, the four seasons of an athlete and why each season is so individualized, different and important. So talk to us briefly about the four seasons of an athlete. Yeah. So, you know, you can do a needs analysis for any sport, um, you know, uh, whether it's hockey or football or baseball, but in basketball, we basically break it down is you have your um, postseason, okay? And then you have your off season, and then that will lead into your preseason segment or training camp, and then that will lead into your in-season segment. And it's important to look at sport that way because 
And your athlete has different needs of training styles during those four different segments. Um, so yeah, what well, I like to do, yeah, is uh, they've come off of basically a 22, 26 week season. I think we've been playing 35 games, training twice a week. Um, so it's postseason time, and that could last anywhere from zero to six weeks, depending on how successful you were um, in your in your uh, postseason uh, play. And yeah. so that's what basically I call a reconditioning phase. Okay, and certain dysfunctions show up in an athlete, uh, or for me, a basketball player. And there's basically four main deficiencies that show up from an overuse or an undertraining standpoint. And that would be, uh, number one would be weak erectors, a, a, yeah. a huge level of weakness in the posterior chain and low back. So that's really attacked in the postseason because there's not a whole lot of low back training that goes on in season. We're running, yeah. jumping, playing, practicing three hours a day. They can't be sore you know, for games and things like that. So there's not a whole lot of Olympic lifting and heavy deadlifts and RDLs and boot camping, all that type of stuff. Um, so when postseason hits, it's like, okay, I've got to get these guys, um, their work capacity up because the volume has been so low in season. So I've got to recondition them from a metabolic standpoint, uh, get their ability to handle lactic acid and, and as well as strengthen the posterior chain and low back. So that's really attacked in the postseason. And um, whenever I'm teaching, I always say, look, the best way to do that is a system called GBC for athletes. Uh, it's a system from, from Charles. It's basically German body composition for athletes where uh, there's an upper and lower body systematic pairing every session, but there's, there's some sort of deadlift or posterior chain in the A series, whether it's a snatch grip deadlift, trap bar deadlift, clean grip, grip deadlift, whatever it may be, paired with an upper body movement. And as the system progresses, I like to end with some sort of finisher uh, to get their metabolic condition up, whether it's, you know, sled drags, prowler, tire flips, things like that. Um, so that would be the short version of what happens in, in the postseason. And then that would lead me to the off season and every sport. Some sports have like one month. <laughs> I get 12 weeks. Uh, some sports get yeah. 16. I have 12 weeks of off season, which is like, really, really, really short. And that's broken down into two six week segments. So I have the team there for six weeks they get a week off and then I have them for another six weeks. And that's when the majority of the specific individualized programming is going on. I may have uh, 13 guys on 13, 13 different programs because they all have a needs analysis. And yeah. what happens in the off season is their program design is based off of three factors. Number one would be their training age. How long have I had them? Zero, one, two, three, four years. Then it would be their training goal because when you're training athletes, their training goal is going to change and evolve throughout their career. So when yeah. they come in, the incoming freshmen, most of them are, are very weak and skinny and they need to get stronger and bigger uh, and so forth. And as their yeah. playing tra training age goes up and they're playing uh, career you know, it goes up, they get a lot of wear and tear and miles on their wheels and they've accomplished that goal, then they have to go to a different goal. So I look at that. And then the third factor would be, I look at their neurotransmitter makeup. Um, and you would ask when they come in as part of their assessment, I do a neural profiling on them, seeing what type of training they'll make the best progress off of um, with respect to frequency of training. How often can they train a certain body part? What sets and reps will they respond best to? Um, it's basically a needs analysis off of their um, personality yeah. profile. Um, so some guys in the off season are training five days a week. Some guys are going twice a day. Some guys are going four days a week. And I may have a four-year veteran and he may be going just three days a week. It depends on who they are and what do they need because you got to remember your job as a strength coach is to increase athletic performance. What right. style of training do you need to uh, put them on in order to increase power, jump fast, uh, jump higher, run faster, get them more mobile, things like that? Because anyone can get anyone big and strong. That's great. But that does not necessarily mean it's going to make them a better player or a better athlete. Um, so I think the one thing that you would say that's important to note for our students is 
Note that he did say that, you know, he has athletes that are maybe training five, six days a week, twice a day, four day, four times a week, and even three times a week. And I think sometimes coaches get so caught up, uh, caught up in this is the perfect plan and it, it's applicable across all athletes. Unfortunately, just like your other clients, it's not the case. And I think that's really important to note that you need to be very specific and making sure that you are, like you said, making sure that the program aligns with your athletes' needs and who they are. And I think one thing that sets you apart from a lot of coaches, because I'm unsure if there are many coaches that do a coach like you do when it comes to, you know, an analyzing their neurotransmitter profile and finding these programs that, you know, they actually will be able to not only maybe not enjoy because, you know, some training sessions are really difficult, but at least you have that training morale where they are continuing to come back, right? And keep pushing. If they hated their training programming to a T, you're less likely to have that athlete want to wake up in the morning to show up and be better, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that took, that was a hard lesson for me to learn uh, because before I started doing this, I could tell you hundreds and hundreds of stories that of, of, I'll give you one example, and, and, and one of my players would come in and he wanted to do German volume training one day, and the next day he wanted to do CrossFit, and the next day he wanted to do West Side training, and then the next day he just wanted to stretch, like he was never happy. I mean, I said, what do I have today? Today's a lower body day. Man, all we do is lower body. So, you know, I said, Pat, if, you, if I said you're going to bench press today, you would complain about that. So. When I ended up finding out uh, his neural profile, it made sense to me where he needed a ton of variety and something had to be different in every single training session or he would be angry and like not want to come back. He wasn't lazy. Yeah. He loved to work. He was in the gym four hours a day and loved to train, but he was just, if he had to repeat his program twice in a row, he was just a miserable human being. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that was really, really important uh, factor to learn. But uh, the second limiting factor is a weak VMO, okay? Yeah. Uh, because it's a jumping sport uh, and landing sport, a lot of basketball players have weak VMOs. So in the off-season segment, that's there's a huge emphasis placed on driving up the front squat. The yeah. front squat. And as we've talked about before, when I'm talking about increasing lower body strength and power, one thing to keep in mind is uh, not all squats are created equal. Okay. So on the continuum, if you have the front squat and then you have the low bar back squat, the front squat obviously has a greater emphasis on the knee where the uh, low bar or powerless squat has a greater emphasis on the hip. So I will use a variety of squat variations, whether it's front squat, safety bar squat, Olympic back squat, whatever it may be. And there's certain times of the year where different squat variations are emphasized. Um, yeah. I'll do more safety bar squats in season, uh, but in the off season, that is my time to drive up their front squat norms because yeah. that goes, uh, the front squat in sport is basically correlated to everything. Yeah. Okay. So it's important for knee integrity, uh, leg strength and jumping power and things like that. Uh, when but, you just mentioned, oh, go ahead. Uh, so with, with that being said, I get a lot of flack from some colleagues of like, why do you guys do arms? <laughs> why do basketball players need to do arms? Okay. Well, they want to look good. Number one, but yeah. <laughs> beyond that, the, it's important to know when you're training an athlete, especially uh, in a lower body dominant sport, the upper body strength has to match the torque of the lower body strength. Yeah. And if not, there's a, it's going to lead to some form of injury, whether it's an ankle or knee or a hip or a back injury. So it's important to train the upper body in the correct way, but specifically a reason, uh, I do a lot of upper body training with my uh, athletes is it has to match the torque of the lower body strength. Yeah. And you touched on, this was one of our questions about the, you know, movement patterns like squatting and deadlifting and why, you know, compound lifts like that are so important for athletes. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, deadlifting specifically, you touched on squatting. Why are such big lifts 
how is such a big lift going to help, like you said, an athlete run faster or jump higher, right? You see sometimes athletes are like, well, no, I just need to keep practicing on the court. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, there's numerous uh, deadlift variations that we, as we know, and they all have uh, a specific return investment. So let's break the deadlift down um, in different ways. But number one, you can't Olympic lift if you can't deadlift. Yeah. Okay. And we could spend hours talking about Olympic lifting and it's a transfer of sport, but we know uh, if you drive up your maximal strength in Olympic lift variations, then you're going to jump higher. If you yeah. went to the, every year at the Olympics, if you measured the vertical jump out of all the athletes, true, the weightlifters have the highest vertical jump out of all the athletes at the Olympics. Now, they can't, play, now they can't play basketball or the darn but they can jump the highest because they can produce the most power with respect to their right. body weight. Okay. Right. So number one, I use deadlifts as a teaching tool to progress to different Olympic lifting variations. Okay. Now, not every player does full power snatch. Not every uh, player does full power clean. I have to look at them as an athlete holistically and say, okay, if I'm going to prescribe an exercise that has to have a tremendous level of return investment, I'm, I am really against Olympic lifting at some maximal lows. It just doesn't make sense. So if an athlete yeah. doesn't have the technique to snatch, he'll do different snatch high pull variations. Um, yeah. If he can't master the technique on a clean properly, then he'll do different uh, clean pull variations and things like that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we can talk about this later on, but if they can't do either, then we'll do different push presses and things like that. Um, and that will increase yeah. work but back to the deadlift it's a precursor to olympic lifting okay but also we talked about the the top earners in sport are the fastest from zero to ten meters yes and people who make the most money in sport whether it's soccer or whatever like can go from the dead stop to 10 meters the fastest and starting strength uh or the intro, the first uh, 10 meters of the sprint is directly correlated to lower back strength. Yep. Okay. If you want to get faster, you can't just do back extension and the reverse hypers. You're going to have to deadlift, trap bar deadlift, snatch grip deadlift, things like that. Um, so if you want to run faster and jump higher, you have to train the posterior chain. And if you want yep. to train the posterior chain, then you have to deadlift. Okay. Um, yeah. I love doing snatch grip deadlifts off of a deficit or podium with my basketball players yeah. once they uh, do the technique properly because it has the greatest percentage of recruiting uh, the posterior chain fibers, more so than trap yeah. bar and more so than clean grip deadlifts. doesn't mean those other two variations are bad, but they have a specific rhyme and reason in my program design. Um, but snatch grip deadlifts off of a podium are phenomenal for packing on strength uh, to the posterior chain as well. I found that when I uh, do a three beat block or whatever it may be of snatch grip deadlifts with um, my athletes, their lean mass actually goes up too. So it's a great exercise to put on a little bit of uh, functional hypertrophy and things like that. Okay. But what form of deadlift do you choose and when? Yeah. Okay. So what I do is when my season ends, uh, right before postseason starts, remember I said the majority of the postseason is a, a reconditioning phase for the low back and posterior chain. Yeah. I will measure their uh, sprint. Uh, it's a three quarter court uh, basketball sprint. So from the baseline to the far free throw line is basically three quarters of the entire court. Yeah. And I'll, I'll break that down in the 10 meter segments on a timing system. I want to see how fast they can go from A to B, but specifically within that sprint, I want to see if they get out of the blocks fast and then they slow down. Or yeah. if like Fred Flintstone, it takes a while to get the wheels going and then they pick up speed. So that tells yeah. me if they have a, a, a slow start or a slow finish. Now, yeah. Why is that important? It 
it basically tells you what deadlifts you should do with respect to, uh, do you start out with a long range of motion and then progress to a short range of motion? Or do you start out with a short range of motion and progress to a long range of motion throughout your periodization? Okay, so I have them do the sprint. I look at their times. If they have uh, a slow start and then pick up yeah. speed, which most people do unless you're a professional track sprinter, then that means that their lower back is weak. Yeah. Okay, because zero to 10 is low back strength. So if it's slow, I'll go from a long range of motion to a short range of motion with respect to the deadlift exercise variation that would be prescribed. Yeah. So if you have a slow start, I'll go with snatch grip deadlifts on a podium. And then I would do uh, like regular deadlift, clean grip deadlift. And then I do trap bar deadlift. And then I would go into like a clean pull or rack pull or something like that. So from long to short. Now, if they get out of the blocks fast and then they start slowing down, then it would be the reverse. I would go from a rack pull, trap bar deadlift, clean grip deadlift, and now I end with a snatch grip deadlift on the podium. So two completely opposite ways to train an athlete, yep. but it's really important because one, you have a short amount of time. You can't go wrong with your your, your uh, program design. You yeah. cannot do that in the service. It, you, it's a waste and you're out of luck. So you have to know is there, what you're doing Yeah. Is there a sweet spot when it comes to training volume so that, you know, during that short period of time when you are programming, you're not doing your athlete a disservice by overtraining them, but you are training them enough where they are making those improvements for their in season. Yeah. I mean, number one, that goes into the art of coaching of experience. You have to know your athlete and what they will respond to. Uh, yeah. So there's that level, like when you're training an athlete, you're always assessing them. You're assessing everything, movement patterns, fatigue uh, patterns and, and things like that. But that goes back to their uh, neurotransmitter makeup because uh, who they are is going to dictate what rep ranges they uh, will thrive in. So if I had yeah. a, high dopamine guy and I was doing five sets of eight snatch grip deadlifts, that's wrong. He's going to overtrain and not recover. And he's not going to come back the next day. Uh, so you have to know what rep brackets that they will respond best to. But beyond that, you got to look at what time of the year you're doing what. So in the postseason, yeah. when it's reconditioning phase, I want to do a lot more volume. I want to come close to overtraining them. I want it to be really, really, really demanding because they have no other responsibility in the world except to train and to go to class. There's no practice yeah. games. There's nothing. So, but in the off season, if I have 12 weeks and I'm trying to peak, uh, in a power clean, doesn't mean you have to power clean for 12 straight weeks. I will do, uh, different deadlift variations and progressing into the clean and then maybe do three or four weeks of cleans and then I'll peak it. And that just depends on, on who it is. So there's not necessarily a sweet spot. It's more of who it is, what is their training goal and, and what reps they will respond to or make the best progress off of, you know, yeah, so if you generalize it. If you're going from long range of motion to short, or you're going from snatch to dead long podium to progressing, your volume is going to decrease throughout the cycle, obviously. But yeah. where it gets tricky, uh, as a strength coach for athletes, you have to know when to deload them because yeah. some guys need deloading, some guys don't. If you have an acetylcholine based guy, there's non-negotiable. You have to drop volume every session and go up in intensity. But on that third week, you have to drastically, I mean, drastically cut volume because those guys have very uh, fragile tendons and ligaments and they'll overtrain fast. Where if you have a different profile, like guy, he can keep going, going, going. Yeah. We have one of our students asking a follow-up question. His name is Scott. Scott, thank you for listening and joining in today. His question is, how do you measure if your training programming improves the athletic performance for your athletes? So do you have a means of measuring progress to know how to be adjusting your programming? 
Yeah. Thanks for asking that question, Scott. That, that's, that's a good question. And one of the things that uh, you have to understand when you have a team, no matter on what level, whether it's the MBA and professional level or college or high school, whatever it may be, your job as a strength coach is you have to provide data to the coaching staff or even the front office or general manager. They are always wanting data. And so with that being said, you always have to be testing and assessing all the time. Yeah. Okay? Because if I go to my head coach and I say, hey, so-and-so, you know, power cleaned 132 kilo today, he, he doesn't care. Coaches yeah. want to know, coaches want to know two things. All they care about is two things. Are they in shape? What's their fitness level? <laughs> That's all they care about. And then in my sport is how high can they jump? What's their vertical? What's their vertical? That's all they care about as well as body weight, things like that. So, um, I'm very fortunate at Miami. We have a sports science, uh, team that does force plate analysis. Um, I get to dictate how often they do that. Um, yeah. I will have them basically do that uh, once a week or once every two weeks, depending on, on, uh, on what time of the year it is. But I will always look, okay, so as we said earlier, as a strength coach, you have an athlete, it's not just about getting them stronger, you have to get them more powerful. Well, what's a yeah. great measure of power? The vertical jump. So I will test their vertical jump, um, you know, periodically, depending on what phase they're in and things like that. And that tells me if they're making progress because just because they're getting stronger doesn't mean that they're getting more powerful. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about the preseason, because that's my conversion to power phase or transformation phase and things like that. But, but yeah, yeah always, about you always have to be uh, testing uh, something and reporting yeah. that to the, to the uh, coaching staff or front office. And for me, it's, it's the vertical jump. I'll test in a, a standing vertical jump and then also a one step or counter movement vertical jump. I'll do both. Yeah. And we have, we're about to dive into talking about prehab and rehab, but we have one, one more follow-up question on this, talking about the assessments. We have a student asking, how often do you implement score sheets with your athletes? And if so, how do they respond to having to fill them in during training? Is that a tool that you use? How often do we implement what? Um, how often do you implement score sheets with your athletes? And if so, how do they respond to having to fill them in during training? I'm assuming this is some sort of means of measuring their performance during their sessions. Is it like, how are they feeling? Are yeah. They so like, how do, they feel, do, do your athletes fill in score sheets on their training? Like how do they feel after their training? Or is that something that you do verbally with your athletes? I think that's kind of what the question is about. Okay. Okay, I'll tell a quick story and that'll explain uh, a little bit about what I do and why I want to do it. But there's there is a wearable device. I don't know if I can say the name brand of it or not, so I won't. Um, there was a wearable device that came out uh, about six years ago. And we were the first basketball team to use them. And it gave me a recovery score, sleep score, strain, HRV, everything. So I had a lot of data on the players. Uh, but what had happened is I could tell how much they slept, their latency periods, or how often they were awake. I could tell what time they went to bed. Um, and so these, they did not want to wear them. And I said, look, I don't care if you go to bed at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. I'm not going to go tell the head coach on you. This is for my information and for my data. Um, yeah. Anyways, long story short, uh, they wouldn't wear them or they would put them on their girlfriend's arms. Uh, they would put them on their dog. It just became an absolute disaster. And then the head coach wanted all this information. And so then he wanted me to punish the guys that didn't wear, wear them and run them. And I said, this is, this is not, not my best. I'll, I'll never, ever, ever, ever do it again. Um, but anyways, th that kind of led me to um, getting information on my players of recovery and when they would come in. I had an idea ahead of time. Okay, this player was here, so maybe I need to back off training wise. And I completely got away from that. I said, you know what? I have a job to do. I need to accomplish my job. 
I don't care how they feel. If they're tired, shame on them. If they didn't go to bed, shame on them. If they're sad or in a bad mood, I could care less. Like I have a goal and we're going to accomplish it. I'm going to change behavior. I'm going to teach them how to work. Uh, and I'm going to set them up for success within the training program. So what I completely got away from that, I have my plan. I have my goal. When my athletes come in, I don't give them their workout card or sheet and say, here you go. And they go do it. And it's not on an app where they're doing it. I, yeah. I personally train every player on the team and I have an assistant that helps me and I will dictate the load of every single set. Yeah. So an athlete has a wave of seven, five, three, seven, five, three. I watch the set. I watch the execution. I watch the tempo. I know their lever length. I know who it is. Um, I will tell them the load for that next set. And I yeah. never, ever, ever have an athlete miss a rep like ever, because it's one of my gifts and skills is I know to the nearest quarter kilo, the precise load that they need to do for that next set. And that's based off of experience and knowing them and training them and things like that. Um, yeah. Whereas when the last rep of the training session is complete, they have a shake in their hand and they're out the door to go to class, to study hall, to go to film study with a coach. They may have a workout on the court. So for me personally, just from experience, there's no score sheet with respect to emotions and feelings and any of that stuff. Like I, I, I don't care. Yeah. I, I'm going to get them stronger. I'm going to get them in better shape. I'm going to get them powerful. I'm going to get them lead, lean. That's my job. And I know how to do that uh, to the best of my ability. I don't know if that answers yeah. the question or not. Uh, Hopefully yeah. you did answer that question yeah. for our student. Yeah. I mean, like HRV is important. I do need to know. Uh, and we measure all that type of stuff in a different way, but it's not going yeah. to affect my program design. I know when yeah. an athlete is training during the session. I know when to back off. I know when to maybe cut a set out here or there or drop reps or things like that. That's just from experience. But just yeah. because they have a questionnaire and they put a sad face on it, I'm going to rip it up and throw it out the window. And I'm like, we, I'm not wasting my time and energy with these. Exactly. Things. Yeah. I hope, like I said, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for submitting it. We're going to go into talking about prehab and rehab because again, guys, we have heaps to cover and I want to make sure we cover as many of the topics as we can. So going into prehab and rehab, one of the first questions, and you kind of touched on it earlier is, you know, going into what are the common injuries that you see during and in season um, and what can you do specifically to prevent them in the off season and then during um, the rest of the season besides playtime? Sure. Well, in basketball, there's two common injuries all the time. Number one is ankle sprains. Yeah. And then number two is lower body injuries, whether it's yeah. the ACL or meniscus, uh, you know, for the, for the most part. So... You want to do everything that you can do, obviously, to prevent injuries, but things are going to happen in sport. It's a contact sport. You can't prevent everything, um, but you can prevent a lot by training them the right way with respect to structural balance. Yeah. Okay. And that phrase gets probably thrown around a lot, um, but I think it was in 1999 when we first started doing that and Charles had a ton of data from international athletes, Olympic athletes, whatever. He compiled all these strength ratios and that's kind of how it, it started and evolved. And what we found was if you can achieve the norms within the structural balance spectrum, your performance is going to go up, which is great. But more importantly, the, the rate of injury goes down. Yeah. Okay, so that's number one is what is the ratio of the front squat to the back squat, um, upper body, obviously, with respect to the close grip bench, what's the ratio of the dip, the overhead press, Scott curl, behind the neck press, you go on and on, trap three raise, external rotation. We're, we're looking at all those uh, numbers, and those numbers are always compiled into my computer software database. So at the end of every week, I type in their numbers and it tells me what exercise they need to spend more time on. So line tricep extension is way off on the graph with respect to post-grip bench. I need to, I know I need to spend more yeah. time training the elbow extensors and blah, blah, blah. So 
Number one is achieving structural balance that is crucial for the integrity of the athlete's uh, joints, okay? Um, but beyond that, increasing dorsiflexion is really important for an athlete when you're talking about the ankle, because we know that the athlete that can dorsiflex the most is gonna win because he's gonna be the fastest. Um, but most of these athletes have such poor ankle mobility that you have to spend a lot of time um, increasing dorsiflexion. So heels elevated squats, you know, we'll go through our step up and split squat progressions, which is really, really important for um, ankle, knee and hip stability. I think it's important in program design is you always have to keep in mind that you have to uh, isolate before you can integrate. So before you start yeah. back squatting, front squatting, deadlifting, whatever, you have to spend a lot of time uh, doing unilateral work in keeping the strength ratios and uh, volume systematically correlated with each other. So for every yeah. rep of a split squat, we're doing a rep of a unilateral leg curl. For every rep of a dumbbell press, we're doing a rep of a chin or a row. It has to be a balance um, in that program design. But with respect to ankle, um, and, and you can do all the split squats and heels elevated squats, and you can do all the prehab with bands and stability and all that stuff, but if you're not actually changing the soft tissue structure of the of the foot, yeah. it's not going to matter. So we'll spend a lot of time doing uh, gua sha and fat tool and ART and things like that because you have to you have to change the soft tissue um, uh, of the ankle. But what's really important in basketball is it depends on where you at, where you're at, because there's a lot of politics and bureaucracy. But when my season ends, all the way up until preseason, they do not get taped at all. If we're doing individual instruction or skill workout on the court, doing shots and, and uh, work, or we're doing a 40 minute team workout or practice, whatever it may be in the off season, because we, they get four hours a week on the court in the off season, which stinks, but it, we're not doing bone on bone practice, full court, getting up and down. It's more skill work and things like that, but there's zero taping. It's my time to get their ankles stronger also. So yeah, and not dependent on the tape itself. Correct, correct, correct. So we'll do some, um, a great exercise that we do in the off season to increase ankle stability is we'll do um, heavy uh, farmer's walks and things like that barefoot. Yep, so they barefoot. take the yeah, take the shoes off and they'll be barefoot and they do a heavy, um, you know, 20 meter, 30 meter farmer's carriage and things like that. That, that's great for ankle ankle stability. Yep. But uh, what we do is when preseason starts, and we'll get into that in just a little bit, but when that starts all the way to the very last game, uh, there's a segment of the day which I call prehab. So they will come in and they'll do their strength training in the morning. There may be a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock group. An hour before practice starts, when the athlete walks into the building or the arena, they have to come see me immediately before doing anything. And we'll do a five to seven minute prehab routine. That's not uh, pre-practice neurostimulation, getting them ready for practice. It's all the, I won't say garbage, it's all the stuff that I don't like spending time doing in their strength training. So I've taken that component out and separated so it's more quality. And we'll have, an, well, yeah, so they'll come in, they have to take their shoes off. Um, they'll be barefoot or in their socks. We'll have a hip stability station. Um, I'll have an ankle station. I'll have uh, a hip flexor or uh, low back or hip flexor psoas station. And I'll have a T-spine station. And then the last station, uh, I think it would be fair to say that I'm the only college program in the country that trains the eyes. We'll do an eye station. Interesting. And why is that? Because uh, it's the best way to get the brain to communicate to the foot. If you want to prevent ankle sprains, yeah. uh, then train the eyes to be balanced because this is, beyond, this is off topic, but what happens is when you're born, you're not right or left-handed immediately, right? But as you, from when you're born to as you age, you end up having a dominant eye. Yeah. 
that's correlated uh, to your posture and so forth. It's uh, my good friend Annette Bukov. He's from uh, she's uh, from Montreal from Posture Pro. But she taught me this. She would come and work with my team every year, and it it, it changed my uh, world in the sense of, of of ankle sprains because what we found is these athletes have a dominant eye, throws out proprioceptive, but it it basically slows the pathway of when the brain talks to the foot. Gotcha. Yeah. So anyway, so I'll have an eye station and now we'll do a prehab program, uh, three times and then we'll switch it and we'll progress through. So there's different mobility and stability exercises in there to strengthen or loosen, uh, different musculature. So with talking about the foot, um, they'll just they'll be different modalities, uh, whether it's e version, uh, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, whatever it may be of making sure everything is strong and stable. So that's a great way uh, to remove ankle sprains. And then the last way, I'll tell you, I was having dinner with a, a colleague of mine, um, Al Vermeule, who's the strength coach for the Chicago Bulls forever. And he won six titles. Um, huge influence on me also. But we were having dinner and I said, hey, Al, I have five ankle sprains. Like, what is going on? I like, this is crazy. And yeah. uh, he said, do you uh, train the calves? I said, no, I said, I don't have a calf machine. That's like bodybuilding. He said, exactly. He said, everyone had a calf machine in their gym in the eighties. And then all the sports performance centers or weight rooms uh, for athletes took them out. He said, it was a bodybuilding. Yeah. And he said, I want you to buy a calf machine. And from preseason to in season, I want you to train the calves at least once a week. Not high volume drop sets, nothing like that, but just basic, yeah. you know, what a four by 10 or whatever, four by 12, um, but pause in the stretch position and pause in the flex position and get back to me. And so I immediately bought a cap machine, started doing it and knock on wood to this day, like very, very, very few uh, ankle sprains. So. Yeah. And I think that goes back hand in hand with, you know, and we've had other educators talk about the importance of, I know we throw this word around, but structural balance and knowing that you can't really neglect a certain muscle group and why, you know, if you are facing issues, it could be because of a deficiency in strength, right. And, and you know, the muscle mass in specific areas of your body. So I think that's an interesting story to bring up how something like, you know, training your calves could prevent injury um, around the foot. And I think, you know, we need to kind of, again, go back to assessing your athletes and figuring out what they need in order to be improving that and not, not be so stuck on our old ways. Cause you could learn from other mentors and, you know, trying other methods to try, you know, bring the best for your athletes, right? We don't want to do copy pasting programming. Yeah, no. And, and a lot of, uh, basketball players have elbow issues and they say it's from too much shooting or passing or whatever. What I've found is it's not actually the elbow, it's the grip strength. And so, yep, four. Yeah. And yeah, so I started doing a lot more grip work with the guys and elbow and shoulder issues cleared up uh, quite a bit. But uh, so anyway, so ankle sprains and then lower body uh, uh, extremity injuries are really, really common. So with respect to the lower body, there's uh, two things I really focus on. I told you structural balance isolating before integrating things like that. Um, yeah. but in the off season, that's my time to drive up their front squat norms because that's correlated to the VMO or, or knee extensors. Yeah. Um, so I aim for the ratio to be 85% front squat to their back squat one RM. If they cannot uh, front squat 85% of their back squat, then I'll spend more time on that. Um, but what I think is really important is if you're talking about the ACL, the, one of the best ways to prevent ACL is obviously balancing out uh, the VMO and so forth. That's correlated to ACL, but knee flexor strength uh, is vital to ACL prevention. Okay. So yeah. I, Charles basically taught me that the leg curl in pounds, for X amount of reps should be the same as the same reps of front squat and kilos for the same reps. Interesting. So in the off season, I'm driving up front squat norms, but I'm also driving up knee flexor strength. And that has uh, done wonders for 
keeping the ACL healthy. And then if you want to protect the meniscus, okay, the best way is to eccentrically strengthen the quads. You have to train the quads at slow tempos on the eccentrics. Um, so I'll do cloak off squats. I'll do Medvedev squats, uh, different variations where it's an eccentric training of the quads. That's uh, tremendous for protecting the meniscus. Yeah. 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 And, you know, kind of goes into, we talk, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think to take that a little bit further, uh, for the young coaches out there, if you're going to work in sport, you're going to have huge level of demands placed upon you by the coaching staff for numbers. How strong, how much can he squat? How much can he squat? How much can he deadlift? Whatever. They don't care about form. They don't care about, they want an impressive number. And I think when you're talking about uh, injury prevention or, or prehab and common injuries, two things. Number one, you have to remember that strength is gained in the range of motion it is trained in. Okay. Yeah. So it is non-negotiable for me. Every exercise, unless it's, unless it's for a specific reason, has to be accomplished in a full range of motion. Yeah. I'm not doing a 200 kilo front squat halfway. I don't care. I don't care if it's 60 kilo and he can go all the way down and pro whatever. We'll progress in strength, but strength is gained in the range of motion is trained. But if you want to prevent injuries, then lighten the load and do it correctly in the full range of motion. That's that is non negotiable as a coach. Tell your coaching staff to screw off. You're here to make your athletes better and keep them healthy. And so full range yeah. of motion is going to be achieved on every rep. Yeah. And the, talking about full range of motion, I'll ask the other question I was going to ask afterwards, but kind of goes back to, and you know, we did do some work together when we uh, were able to meet, um, but talking about that mobility, right? There are certain things that are limiting factors for that full range of motion. Talk to us real quick, a little bit about how you, you program and what you do to increase athletes' mobility so that they are performing things to the full range of motion. For example, movements like the squat. Sure. Well, I'm going to try and keep myself from saying that stretching is a waste of time, even though I just said it. Uh, but you have to look at, in whatever exercise, where is the dysfunction or limiting range of motion coming from? Okay, so all of my players can squat butt to the floor. I have two seven-foot giants who can squat all the way down to the floor. They didn't come in like that Yeah. We had to be able to achieve that. So you have to look at the chain as, as what's hindering from doing that. It's not the teller tendonitis or sore knees. It's, is it the ankle? Is it the hip? Is it the T-spine? Is it the shoulder? Whatever it might be. But the secret when you have a tall guy to squatting all the way down to the floor is you check the piriformis. So there's different yeah. ways to make an athlete more mobile with respect to range of motion with strength training. Um, I would use different modalities, but I love the uh, fascial abrasion technique, the fat tool, uh, because it'll actually, uh, in certain musculatures, like for example, the piriformis, you can stretch the piriformis between every set and you may gain a little bit of range of motion, but you can release the piriformis instantly and get a guy to drop, you know, a foot on a squat or whatever. So they all are heels elevated, uh, which helps obviously with range of motion and getting that depth, um, as well as increasing dorsal flexion. But if you have a tall athlete that can't squat all the way down, always check the piriformis. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's limiting factor. So we will get the fat tool and release it and then progress up and set, maybe work on it again, uh, maybe some ART, uh, whatever it may be. And then that will usually get them uh, to squat full. Now, there's other modalities and I think we got to experience this, but one of the great tools that I was taught at a very young age was uh, PIMPS. It was the Poliquin Instant Muscle Strengthening Technique, really cool name. Um, but it's basically a way to uh, 
uh, trick the nervous system to uh, release a muscle as well as to get it to fire. So for example, um, if they're really tight in a split squat or they're tight in a back squat or front squat, it may be the psoas. Um, so we will release the psoas instantly with a point right on the shin and then the psoas is lengthened. So there's different ways, but as a coach, you have to identify where is the tightness or hindrance coming from. So for example, if there's, uh, what happens a lot of times with basketball guys, because their arms are eight feet long, they can, they can uh, scratch their ankles without leaning over. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the shoulder uh, mobility or shoulder tightness actually comes from the brachioradialis of the elbow. So we'll release the brachioradialis and then their shoulder uh, mobility increases quite dramatically. So you have to identify what, what, what is happening in the body. It's not always the muscle that you think it may be. It's, it's a cog somewhere in the chain. So Yeah, and for yeah. our students who are watching, just real quick, make sure you go check out our YouTube channel. We have some exclusive content that myself and Preston created, and he's showing all of these techniques. And let me tell you, I myself was shocked when he did perform some of these things and we saw, you know, increased ranges of motion there we, um, and squat mobility as well with Kate Robertson, who is our master coach. So make sure you go follow our YouTube channel because we are periodically releasing those videos. And I, those are gems, especially for coaches who want to be coaching athletes, but anybody who wants to have little tricks in their toolbox to help their athletes and clients perform at their best. And, you know, it's just interesting to see because a lot of the techniques that you did show were very unique to me as I wasn't familiar with them, nor have I seen other coaches do them. So I do think that, you know, don't knock it till you try it. Because when he tried it on me, I was like, I was shocked. And everybody in the room was like, what is going on? So make sure you go check out our YouTube channel because there are some gems in there. All right, good, good. Um, and then I want to say one more thing with respect to uh, injury, common injuries and prehab and injury prevention and so forth. So we covered the ankle and we covered uh, the knee, uh, but the third component to preventing injuries um, beyond uh, structural balance and all that stuff is when you have an athlete and he is in his competitive season, obviously the number one goal of, of in season is competing and winning games and practicing at a high level every day. Um, and getting better some way, somehow in, in the craft of, of, of the sport, but you have to maintain your lean mass in season. Yeah. It is directly correlated to injury. You can get on PubMed and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of studies showing that injury, the rate of injury is directly correlated to their lean mass. So yeah. What does that mean as a strength coach? It means that in your program design in season, even if you're only training twice a week, you still have to train in rep brackets uh, that will help maintain their lean mass. And strength training in season has to be done at a consistent level. So for me, uh, we'll always train the day after a game immediately. It helps with regeneration. Um, as well as maintaining their lean mass. And then we'll train two days before their competitive day. Um, but what you'll find is when you have a team, you know, in basketball, there's only five guys that can play out on the court at once. And there's, yeah. there's 40 minutes in a game. You have 13 guys. Well, all 13 guys can't play 40 minutes. The game's not, you know, 13 hours long. So the players that don't play as many minutes, I may grab them and say, hey, you know, tomorrow we're going to do a little bit more. I may do a little bit more extra in that next day's lift because they're going to have three game, three days before the next game, so they're not going to be sore. But you have to uh, – what I do is I look at the score sheet after every game, and I say, okay, he played 38 minutes, he played 24, he played three. This guy didn't play at all. He had a – that's basically a day off. Um, so yeah. I may do a little bit more training-wise with him that next day in order to uh, – maintain his lean mass because he's not going to have any level of fatigue um, from that, you know, the, the night's uh, competition. Yeah. yeah. And one question we had to follow up on this from a student is, and talking about, you know, your methods, if you believe in ELDOA and myofascial stretching, Guy Voyer work, do you believe in that? Now, I'm not familiar with that, so. Okay. His name is Guy Voyer. 
<laughs> it looks like Guy Boyer, but it's Guy Boyer. Oh, Guy Boyer. Uh, he, he's a French osteopath. And I had the pleasure in 2001 of meeting him at, uh, at Charles's gym. Uh, gosh, that's 21 years ago. Uh, but his work is phenomenal with what he does with respect to fascial meridians and increasing mobility and things like that. And uh, here's the issue though, is, okay, so I have uh, an athlete, I trained for four years in college. Uh, he just won an, in, I don't wanna say his name, you know, there are some, but people figure out who it is. He just won an NBA title with the Golden State Warriors last year. Oh my okay. goodness, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he moved down to Miami in the off season to train with me. And uh, <laughs> day one, so I'm telling him his workout. And I said, okay, you have this, 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 and this. And I say, you have a uh, front, front foot elevated split squat, whatever. And I trained him for four years. And he looked at me like it was crazy. He's like, yo, P, what's that? I said, that you've done these for four years. Like he had no recollection of eating what exercise was. And he's done it a hundred thousand times. Why am I saying this? Uh, these, uh, the Eldoa stuff is phenomenal, but it's so technical with elevating your right big toe and depressing your left hand, pushing your head up. It's very, very, very technical. And so it's not applicable to my athletes. Now, mm -hmm. They don't have the ability it's it's too much now they can memorize yeah. a thousand different plays and a thousand different moves because that's their craft uh but when it comes to that level of technic uh, technical work with respect to stretching i'm just being honest from experience because i've tried it i've done it it ain't happening it's it's it's, yeah. not, it, it's it's great but there's better ways for my population to achieve that same result now if there was an injury that had happened and it was a post rehabilitation type thing, then yes, but as a way to increase or maintain flexibility and mobility specifically in season, uh, it is, you, you'll, you'll lose your hair. You, you'll lose your mind. It will make you angry. Like it's not happening. So, yeah. And, my, uh, yeah. And now I'm, I'm curious, I'll look into him a little bit more myself because just like, just like anything, I'm a forever student. So I'm very curious to learn from other coaches and people yeah. in the industry. So He's making a sure that path, yeah. osteopath. Yeah. So for anyone who isn't familiar, you could check out the chat and make sure you look them up as well. So you know that who, who, and what we are talking about. Um, one of the questions that I had prior to this, and I myself experienced this with an injury when I was training. So I did professional cheerleading and tearing a meniscus during, you know, one of our biggest competitions definitely felt like I was sh shot in the gut. And I think one of the things, the hardest things for athletes is when they are injured, the frustration because they want to get back to doing what they love to do. And that's competing, playing, um, um, whether it's on the court, on the field, regardless. Now, when it comes to rehabilitation, what is your approach to getting your athlete back on their feet and back in play time as quickly as they can? Because like you said, an injury can, you know, potentially hinder their, you know, success in their career if they're not having, you know, if they have to take that year off or, you know, not being able to have enough play time to be seen by recruiters and things like that. So do you have any approaches when, you know, an athlete is already injured? Um, to get them back on their feet as quickly as you can? Or do you have, is that something that you do or is there someone that's outsourced to handle the rehabilitation process? Sure. So hmm, it's tricky because at this level, there's a complete uh, medical staff. Yeah. There's a complete uh, sports medicine staff and there's a complete physical uh, therapy staff. So there's three different entities to um, sports health. Okay. And that's separate yeah. than sports performance. So you have a team doc, you have a, a, an ortho surgeon, you have a, another doctor, then you have athletic trainers, then you have sports medicine people, and then you have uh, PTs, uh, physical therapists, yeah. physicals off of that. So there's like a lot of, movie, and then there's me. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy and politics when it comes to an injury. Um, yeah. But yes, it's a collaborative approach, but what happens in team sport, even if it's, 
and professional, whatever, like you are not in charge of that athlete's rehab. Yeah. Now, being as hands off. So they're going to give me a list of limitations of what this player can do. They may say no overhead pressing for three weeks. Uh, they may say whatever, maybe no squats or whatever it may be. So I'm always working around that injury because the athlete can always do something. So yeah. Even, Say an athlete tears ACL, just came off of surgery. Obviously, there's like no lower extremity training because it's not going to be allowed to do that. I'm not going to say I'll see you in, in two months. He's still going to do upper body training and things like that. Yeah. And yeah. Train the other leg because you know we know that it'll accentuate the strength and rehab in the, in the contralateral leg and so forth like that. But what happens is they'll give me a list of limitations of what I can and can't do, and I'll build on all of that. But I have enough clout and reputation where I, with uh, our relationship, I can say, okay, hey, I think he needs to strengthen his uh, adductors, whatever, to accentuate the rehab of his ACL because I noticed this, this, you know, whatever. So it's a collaborative approach, but they take that and that's kind of their lead. Um, yeah. But when he is semi-cleared and then they say, okay, he can start doing some uh, BMO step ups. I will take the athlete and I'm assessing him and I'll kind of do my own form of rehab, but I call it strength training to them because uh, I would rehab a knee differently than them probably. I shouldn't be saying this, but yeah. uh, I will accentuate his rehab with my tools. But the, the difference is um, I will not do any soft tissue. I will not put my hands on that athlete's joint or anything post, post surgery turn to play because you're setting yourself up for failure, but there's different tools with res respect to exercise prescriptions and things like that to accentuate his rehab based on what uh, injury that may be. But it's a very, very tricky, uh, sticky, uh, dynamic, um, when it comes to that. Yeah. The good thing is, is there's so much, it's become so specific now where it's not just orthopedic surgeon and he hands them over to the trainer or doc and does this. And then it, it's so precise and specific now. Um, it's actually a yeah. good thing where, you know, guys are rehabbing ACLs now in like five, six months where it used to be 12 to 18 months, you know, but, but yeah, the recovery but, time has just shrunk entirely. Yeah. One thing that I've always taken a lot of pride in because injury is going to happen. But the beauty of it is if you can excel in your job as a strength coach of getting yeah. your athletes strong as possible in the right way and having that relationship of strength throughout the, the body with respect to structural balance, the beauty of it is the stronger they are pre-injury, the faster they're going to rehab. Yeah. So, Injuries have happened, obviously, in my 27 year career. But the beauty of it is, is they were like balanced and strong, and so they rehab a lot, a lot faster than your uh, other person may. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really important to understand, especially if you are coaching sports athletes. That, like you mentioned, sometimes injuries are inevitable, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. Because at the end of the day, what happens on the court is a little bit you know, out of your control. Um, accidents do happen, but at the end of the day, your goal is to work hand in hand with your athletes and through the frustrations of being injured, because man, is that an emotional ride? And I know how difficult it could be sometimes to try to coach someone who is injured. I think the rule of thumb, and this could be ap applicable, not only just to athletes, but any client is an injury does not mean, you know, completely stopping to train. Now, of course, every injury is unique and making sure that they are, you know, speaking to their doctors and you're communicating with them and, you know, you have that clearance to train, but more times than not, an injury does not mean it's all end. You know, you can find ways to train around it and make move, you know, training movement patterns that are not going to cause more harm to the actual injury. I think that's a common thing when someone, you know, hurts their back or hurts their, you know, knees or something like that, they completely take off. And actually, in my, this is my opinion, it, it does more of a disservice when you are healed and ready to jump back in versus you potentially finding training movement patterns that are working around your injury and maybe actually helping you recover faster when you are fully recovered going and bouncing back into your normal routine becomes a lot easier. 
Um, I've dealt with injuries my whole life as an athlete. And that was the one thing I was super stubborn where it's like, no, you shouldn't be training. And I'm in the gym with my boot and crutches. And I'm like, you know what? I'm doing upper body. There's no way you could keep me off of doing any sort of activity. So I think that's really important for coaches to accept as well. Yeah. I, I think there's three ways that you can really accentuate an athlete's uh, return to play when they're injured is, is, uh, number one, as a strength coach, you can really excel the rehab process with supplementation and nutrition. So yeah. when it really happens, I will put them on a rehab protocol with certain nutrients um, at pretty high levels, like post-surgery immediately, they're getting this, 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 and this, and then weeks yeah. three, six, they're getting this, this, this. So you can really excel um, the rehab process by having that the, the knowledge and tools of what supplements do what with response to inflammation and, and things like that. And then number two is the worst thing an athlete can do psychologically is once they're hurt is sit out there on the sidelines and just watch practice. It's miserable. It, it is, it, it is. So what I do is when an injury has happened, practice starts, I finish my warm up with the team. I'll grab the athlete and then I'll go put him through a 45 minute hour workout or whatever while practice is going on um, just to keep him busy. I'll yeah. take advantage of that time. I've had athletes who have hurt in an ankle or knee or whatever, and they put on, you know, 15 pounds of muscle during the injury of the upper body because we're going to take advantage of that time. You can't play yeah. practice, so we're going to get after it, but it helps them psychologically. You, you know, with, with that, with that too. And then the third thing is, um, you have to find a way when you're, uh, training that athlete on the return to play protocol to instill confidence that, Hey, when you step out on that court, like you're going to be stronger than you were before your injury. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like they have nothing to be nervous about or scared about of planting off of this knee. Cause that's human nature. They're always, they're going to have the, those, and the psychological limitations, but by instilling confidence in that athlete and, and, and letting them know, like, they're ready for this, you're stronger than you were, here's where you were jumping before, here's your strength norms or whatever, you're either where you were or you can still pass that, like, you, you got nothing to worry about. So I think that's three ways you can really influence an athlete from a, from a return to play and, and rehab standpoint. Yeah. And I think, you know, having, being that person for your athletes and being that rock for them during that time is really important. I give full gratitude and thanks to my coach who dealt with all the ups and downs of that. And that was the one thing, like you mentioned, sitting and watching practice was terrible. So I would always be, you know, going to the weight room and just doing something because I just couldn't just sit there and watch and feel so helpless. Um, we have one more question about like rehabilitation from a student, and then we'll go into talking about, you know, actually working with the pros and more about, you know, your education and, you know, getting into where you are now with your career. So the student is saying, one of my clients have an ACL injury. He plays cricket and his um, and is recovered, but he still cannot do squats properly, but his deadlifts and bench press are good. Any suggestion because it's six months. So talking about any suggestions in improving that squat movement pattern. Of course, you don't know too much about this um, client, um, but talking about if his deadlifts and bench presses are moving smoothly, what are ways that this coach can improve their client's squat mobility, given that it's already been six months post injury and he is recovered with from pain. Okay. Well, I think again, like we talked about earlier, you have to, have the question answered why can't he squat fully what what is the limiting factor is it pain in yeah. the patella is the tracking wrong is it the hip is it the, uh, the piriformis or the glute whatever it may be you have to find out why uh but without being able to see him or put my hands on here or it's a bit different but what i would recommend is starting back over on your basic general prep phase and going through your polyquin step ups your vmo step ups unilateral leg curl, establishing that range of motion in those exercises, and then going through your split squat progressions, making sure that he has the, the mobility to do those properly. And then what I would do after that, I would work from hot from top down. And what that means is I would actually start them off with a quad squat or a cyclist squat. Uh, then I would go down to about 30 degrees. And then I would go yeah. down to 15 degrees and they should be able to squat full by then. Uh, but yeah. it could be 
soft tissue. It, it, it could be a many things, but I would start them back over on step up progressions, unilateral progressions, split squat progressions, and then go from a high or quad cyclist squat and work down because the cyclist squat or the quad squat will remedy a tight quad. Uh, and so that would help. Yeah. In, in, uh, in the if that is the cause of the pain. So I think for this coach who asked, because he didn't put his, uh, he, he or she did not put their name. I hope that did answer your question. I think it really comes down to your assessment of your athlete. And then of course, uh, applying the recommendations that Preston did provide. And he did say a big thank you. So, um, we appreciate that, Preston. Now, going into talking about working with the pros, and I know all of us, you know, everyone who's watching, you want to be a successful coach, whether you're coaching athletes, gen pop, physique coaching, regardless who, who and what your niche is, you want to be successful in your field. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what qualifications and necessary um, education is necessary to be successful in your field, being a coach for professional athletes. Ooh, so you want to be a strength coach. <laughs> That's the question. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, there's only so many jobs in sport. There's only so many positions available. Uh, and for me, when I went to college, university at age 17, uh, I volunteered in the weight room. I said, went to the director of strength and conditioning at Clemson. And I said, I think I had like a gold's gym t-shirt on and he like laughed at me, but, uh, I said, Hey, I, I want to be a strength coach and, uh, I'll do whatever it takes. I just, I'll, I want to volunteer. And he said, okay, we need a new janitor. And I said, a janitor. I said, and I, I understood. I wasn't even allowed to spot a guy. I couldn't even, I stood in the corner. And this was for four months now. Uh, I volunteered. All I could do was watch and observe. But I was taking yeah. notes, looking at programs. So I was learning, but I was watching the dynamics of what happens when an athlete or athletes, because there was, it was football at the time, there was like 25, 30 guys coming at a time. I observed what happened when those athletes walked through the doors of how the strength staff interacted with them at the time. So I was learning a lot of intangibles. I learned nothing about program design, sets, reps, loads, nothing. But I learned all about the intangibles of how to communicate with athletes, guys in bad mood coming in and say, yo, I ain't doing this beat today. And like, like how are you going to respond to that? Um, because they're not paying you by the hour. They're, you know, you're getting your own salary. So like, there's a lot of dynamics that were going in that I was picking up on. And then I would go to class. Uh, as a student, and then I had to do my job in the weight room. I cleaned that weight room from six to nine p.m. pretty much every night. That's all I did. And, and so my point is, is so many young coaches are so focused on the end result or the outcome, and not willing to stay in the moment and go through the process each and every day and pay your dues. Okay? Yeah, that's number one. And then. When that semester ended in December, the head strength coach, he may have talked to me once a week, you know, he was testing me, but he said, Hey, I appreciate your loyalty and your work ethic. I can tell this is something you're passionate about. This is something that you want to do. We have a graduate position spot open up, even though I was an undergrad. And he said, I'm going to give you that scholarship. So I had my next three and a half years of college paid for. I was a full-time graduate assistant as an undergrad and I was training volleyball, men's tennis, men's golf, other sports. I was 18 years old. I had no clue what I was doing, <laughs> but that's how I first started out was I was a janitor for four months and I kept my mouth yeah. and I asked specific questions and wanted to learn. But, uh, if you want to get into strength coaching for teams or athletes, there's zero room for ego. Because number one, sports are, it's a player driven enterprise, number one, yeah. um, and you're not there to be their boy and hang out and this and that, like, like there's zero room for, for ego. It, it's about making the athlete and the team better. It's all about winning. Um, so that's the first thing is you're going to be broke, you're going to be poor and you're going to volunteer. Uh, but that is the truth of the situation. Doesn't matter who you are 
what you know, this and that. At the time, it, 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 it's it, it's a very humbling experience. But after that graduate assistantship, you know, I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and it's long hours, it's a grind, um, because you don't just train the athletes and go home. You train the athletes yeah. with the team. And then they have practice. You have to go warm them up for practice. And then that coach is going to want you to be at practice. And so you're there for two or three hours at practice. And then practice is over and you've got to make the shakes and vitamins and regeneration. So there's a lot of moving parts um, that, that go into it. But, you know, the, the thing is, is, is getting in the door is not easy. And you may be stuck for a while, but I've produced uh, 14 head strength coaches in my career. And, and those guys are all successful to this day and still in the business because there's a high rate of burnout or whatever in this business because uh, I taught those guys how to work and, and how to make it about the athlete and the team and, and not make it about themselves or about their ego or using the athletes as a platform on their social media to build up their brand. It's not about that. Yeah. So, but, uh, but beyond that, so it's really important, obviously, the people that are here now, um, it's about education. Okay. I'm still yeah. working this day and I've done it 27 years. I try and get better each and every day or learn something. It's all about education. But with that <laughs> is you have to be really precise of where you're learning and what information you're getting. You cannot become a strength coach by watching Instagram. It drives me nuts. I, I don't have Instagram for a reason. Like, like you cannot learn how to be a coach on Instagram. I, I get it. But, but so for me, um, I was one of the back in the nineties, uh, I was one of the first, uh, PICP or Paul Quinn international certification level five coaches, one of the very, very first, but I was the youngest in the world to ever achieve that certification. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that means for students who are not familiar with that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's similar, uh, and I'll let you speak about it, but it's similar to your guys' education platform because uh, the founder of Clean Health comes from the same background and the same mentor uh, as me. Um, but that certification was really, really important because it, it taught performance training it taught how to train an athlete because there's a difference of training general population versus training an athlete there's a huge difference yeah. there's crossover and, and and some similarities of course obviously um but that certification was really important because it taught as i've probably the third time i've said this today but it taught how to isolate before integrate it taught the proper yeah. progressions it taught how to assess correctly and it taught how to progress properly with the structural balance ratios of lower body progressions and upper body progressions. And then the course went on to progress of how do you take this newfound strength and power and convert it to speed. Uh, yeah. And then beyond that, that certification gave me, and this is, this is true, uh, it gave me tools that no other strength coach in the United States had. Uh, yeah. At least my level like no one knew uh the supplementation and the body fat testing um no one knew the muscle strengthening techniques the ways to increase mobility no one no one knew that back then and i had all these tools and so i'm at these these chinese athletes and they think i'm like this magician they're like whoa whoa you know this is voodoo this is crazy and no one else had that or very few had that skill set um you know, at, at that time. So that's that certification course. I want to be really clear on this. That separated me from a strength as a strength coach than a lot of other people, not by the name of the certification course when I went for jobs, but by my skill set as a coach. Yeah. So when I left uh, Arizona and I went to North Carolina, Charlotte, the administration and the head coach at that university or even when I went there, I went to Stanford from there, the, the people at Stanford had no idea the name of that certification. They didn't know who Charles Paulson was. It didn't matter. Yeah. I had a reputation and a brand as a strength coach going into that interview by producing results and having success with my athletes because I had this toolbox that separated me from a lot of other coaches uh, in the industry. Yeah. At the time. And it wasn't learned I, online. It, it, it wasn't learned on Instagram. It was learned 
you know, back then in person and hands on and those practical and, and yeah. you know, like your exam, like you have to make a hundred percent. You didn't, you didn't have to, you couldn't make an 80% pass the exam. Like a lot of places, like you had to be perfect and precise. And, and so yeah. forth. that really separated uh, myself, but to take that even further, if you want to be a strength coach or a performance coach or whatever label you want to call it, let's be really honest. We, everyone in the world has access to the same amount of information today. And we all have access yeah. to the same info, but what are you going to do when you achieve that? And what are you going to, how are you going to apply that information to your athletes? That that's what separates yourself because there's an art of coaching that, that goes into this business. Yeah. It's not just about, sets and reps and, and so forth like that. There's a whole other aspect to performance training um, that goes into that because athletes need more than just strength. Yeah. You know, um, and they need to be treated differently mentally than just physically. There's an article yeah. that goes into that. I have 15 guys, 13 to 15 guys, and they all need, to, they all need treated different physically with program design, but I have to coach them differently mentally also. Some guys respond. Yeah in your face, hardcore. Some guys, if you look at them the wrong way, they're so sensitive, they're like gonna break down and cry. There's, there's a huge art that goes into this. But, but anyways, education, education, education. You have to get the right education. Not where the university or team's gonna say, oh, you're so-and-so certified, they don't know what that means. But you have to have that skill set to separate yourself from other coaches and, and, and trainers. And I think, you know, it's to your advantage to continue your education. And, and one other thing, like you mentioned, there's one thing to continue your education, but there's another to actually apply it. You don't want to be that student that is constantly taking these certifications back to back to back, but not actually taking the time to apply it with your clients, whether you're in person, online, coaching athletes, gen pop, doesn't really matter. The biggest thing is about, you know, taking the time and that comes with experience. And that's something that unfortunately you can't take a course and buy experience, right? You have to apply what you know. And I think the more that you know, the, the more experience you can get because each client is going to be so unique. And I think even with my own career, you know, I've only, I've been coaching a little over five years now um, to my advantage, because I was the younger coach on the floor was having that toolkit of education so that I could have a wider, wider range of clients that I knew how to, you know, assign certain things to each specific client. And it's to your advantage as coaches to do the same, regardless, you know, how young or how old or when you're starting your, your you know, your coaching career, education will open up those doors for you. But it, it's really important for you to make sure that you're applying what you're learning instead of just hoarding that information and then sticking to your old ways. Yeah. And, and if you want to be a strength coach, you apply that information, but you have to find a way to get those athletes to buy into you consistently because the truth of the situation is, I don't want to ruin this profession for everybody, but like most like athletes don't like to lift weights and train. <laughs> they, they want to play. They want to show up and hoop. They want to show up and ball and practice. Like uh, you have to find a way for them, for them to buy in and it becomes just a part of their daily routine. And, I, I don't have athletes like not show up or miss sessions or whatever. Like they, they love training, but you have to find a way, way to get them to buy in. So it's beyond that skill set. Um, and then beyond that, if you want to be a strength coach, you're going to have to be real with yourself because you are going to have to be really flexible because you may have a head coach who's mad because you lost the game and you're going to have a five hour practice the next day and he's going to run those guys into the ground and then you're going to train that next way. You're going to have to modify your program. And you're going to be mad at yeah. It's throwing off my periodization. This sucks. Like, okay. But the truth of it is, is like your job as a strength coach is to get them physically and mentally ready to compete for that next game. So you're going to yeah. have, you're always going to have modifications with, with what you're doing. Like you work for, a bigger enterprise than yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like Miami's bigger than me. It's not about me. It's, it's about the universe. Yeah. It's about winning. So you're going to have to be really flexible. And, and how are you going to be able to, to handle that? And then like we talked about earlier, are you going to be able to handle the modifications that are set down from sports medicine of, Hey, he's limited, no upper body today. He tweaked the shoulder, yeah. Yeah, there's no upper body today. Like you can't just say, whatever, we're trying to set a record here in the bench press, like you're gonna have to modify stuff. So there's a lot of give and take that goes in and, and 
you know, you got to check your ego, you know, with that. Yeah. And I, and kind of goes into like, back to what we were saying about making sure that you are, you know, you got to have all of those tools in your toolbox because you never know what's, what's to come, whether it's an injury, like you said, the head coach running them to the ground, you're not going to always be able to follow your templates that you learn. Templates are just your blueprint. And the more blueprints you have, the more you can combine them and mesh them together to suit the situation and those athletes. Um, one question I have in, in regards to coaching and hopefully it can help coaches avoid these things is what do you think are common mistakes that you see strength coaches, specifically strength coaches for athletes that are making today? Uh, I would say trying to do too much too fast because yeah. like I said, when I first started out, there was no internet. We didn't have access to this world of training methodology and stuff. Like you actually had to go see someone in person and learn. Uh, and yeah. Do on stuff and I think there's so many young strength coaches now who have so much information but they don't know when to specifically apply it yeah and, and then you get lost in your periodization models and things like that and because here's the deal when you have an athlete you can never ever ever have a wasted training session you yeah you have a short time in the off season you can't waste any time in preseason because you're getting ready for season. You can't waste a session in season because you've got to, you know, you train twice a week or whatever it may be. So you can never, ever, ever have a wasted training session. And by that, I mean trying to do too much too fast or your athlete doesn't make progress because every single training session, no matter what phase of the year it is, they have to get better some way, somehow, whether yeah. it's strength, an extra rep, better work capacity, energy system, whatever it may be, you, you, you have to progress and not regress. And, and so I think a lot of strength coaches try and do too much too fast. And it's like, okay, here's this training method. It's really, really, really cool. I just did my general prep phase for three weeks and then blast. And then it's like, yeah. what the, it, it makes zero sense in the bigger picture. You know, yeah. so my advice when I have young coaches is like, you have to work backwards. Start from when yeah. the is going to start and work backwards and lay it all out. But keep in mind, you're going to have to modify certain things within that. Don't try and do too much too soon. That, that's my number one thing. And then I don't want to harp on this too much, but I, I think another big, big mistake is that, and I know it's a different world we live in today, but making it about themselves and not about the athlete. Like I understand. You have to market yourself for your business and things like that. But look, when you're training an athlete, you coach every single rep. It is not film session, party time. This is going to be a great clip on Instagram. And I'm going to get a hundred more followers because I have so much like, no, when you have your athlete, it's a private session. It's during that duration. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You are there to coach every single rep. I yeah. think it's a big mistake because you miss the moment. You miss coaching. You're filming. Yeah. No. Exactly. And I, I think it's no. it's the professional aspect of it. Since you are coaching professional athletes, and if you want to be coaching professional athletes, you need to hold yourself professionally. And I know it's really hard for coaches. Like you said, unfortunately, we do live in a world where, you know, marketability is big. But when you are, you do have your foot in the door, make sure that you can keep yourself there, right? And making sure that you are producing those results and are as attentive as you can. And sure, you can have someone do those videos for you, but make sure that you're tunnel vision focusing on that athlete in that moment, in that set for that rep. And I think that sometimes, you know, that is overlooked, especially nowadays, especially with PTs, whether you are a sports coach or not, it becomes too much of like, let me show the latest thing and let me record it. You're my model. No. Uh, so that kind of gets smoke, right? It gets yeah. you distracted from doing what you, you know, you love to do and want to do and want to be successful with. Yeah. Yeah. You, you will become successful by producing results, not by becoming yeah. famous on the internet. And that's, yeah. True. When it, it comes to, go ahead. Uh, it, it, it will happen. Take care of your athletes, produce results. They're going to go to the training camp or their season or their team or whatever. And the guys are going to say, Whoa, you know, who did you, who would you train with? You look like this, this, and then it's going to build and, and expand from there. But, but yeah. uh, you were there to make them better. It's not about you. It's about them. And then yeah. we talk about like, don't try and do too much too fast 
with your athlete. There's time. Take your time. Yeah, so. exactly. You want to make sure that you're you're training with a purpose and you're maximizing the time you have. Instead of just rumbling and making mistakes, you want to try to be clear-headed and making sure you're applying the right methods for the short time that you have. One of the questions I did uh, we did have is talking about, you know, you are – you mentioned how their spots are limited to be, you know, a strength coach. There's only so many teams and so many positions for aspiring strength coaches. What would you recommend, especially now being in the position that you're in to help them grow into becoming maybe a position just like you? And, you know, some of them may not have had the opportunity to start with, you know, free, you know, internships or just shadowing or things like that. Talk to us a little bit about some insight you may have for those coaches who are just as passionate as you are and want to be coaching professional athletes eventually in their career. Yeah. You know, um, make connections. And like I said, you know, volunteering is a huge part, you know, like when I was volunteering at my young age at, at Clemson university, I was going around and making connections with, I was just bothering people. I was going to this university and this university and this university, introducing myself and, and or calling them up. And I would say, hey, you know, you have five minutes. Can you tell me, are you doing anything new at this off season with your team? And I would say, hey, I'm a volunteer at Clemson. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a student here, but uh, I just want to talk to you for five minutes. Are you, are you doing anything new or whatever? Just making connections because you never know when they have a paid position open or they may have a different volunteer position open. That would yeah. be number one. Yeah. Um, one of the things that really helped me out <laughs> is when I started volunteering, I made it a point and I walked upstairs from the weight room and I would walk through the coaches' offices every day just to say hi because those are the people that are going to help you get your job. Yeah. Because when, you're, when your team season ends, even if you're volunteering – those assistant coaches are going to go on to get bigger and better positions, whether it's a head coaching position or they're going to take a different assistant position. They're going to know who you are. And this, ha this happened to me. And then when that assistant coach went to another school, you have a relationship with them and they would say, Hey, because there was a level of respect, like our strength training program there was elite, you know, this yeah. is 1995. Uh, it was an elite, elite, college football strength training it had this reputation back then so when those coaches went on throughout the country and spread themselves around our reputation was good bang hey I, we got a position open i need a guy that's how you get your job you know yeah. so in relationships with other strength coaches even if you don't like them and you don't think what they're doing is great you still can have a business relationship yeah. with them but get to know the coaches on the team those yeah. are the going to help you get a job yeah i think that it it's a superpower to be able to just put yourself out there and the answer will always be no until you actually ask and worst case scenario they say i don't have time for you goodbye and then they shut the phone on to the next one so i think that's that's a great piece of advice and that kind of also reflects you know other career opportunities you're an aspiring pt wanting to work with a specific niche in a specific gym it doesn't hurt to call and ask whether they hire you on the spot or you're trying to learn about what's needed and necessary to get that position. If anything, that makes you stand out amongst the rest because you are putting in the effort that a lot of other coaches aren't. And it's showing that you are passionate about what you want to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another thing uh, I want to uh, stress is that when I have volunteers or interns, when I tell them, I said, look, these coaches are going to come down and train. They may just get on a treadmill and run for 30 minutes, you know, hopefully not. But I tell each and every one of my volunteers and interns, when a staff member, even if it's the secretary, because there's been, there's been opportunities where a secretary of the staff helped me actually get a job. And I said, well, yeah. let's walk through the doors. You greet them. You say, hello, can I help you? Take an assistant coach and train him after practice. There's a yeah. there's I had an assistant of mine who's a division one strength coach. He's very, very, very successful. He would train one of the assistant coaches after practice at like eight o'clock every single night, having been there since 6 a.m. It's the last thing he wanted to do. But that assistant coach became a head coach. And when he got the head job, guess who he called? Yeah. He, he called me and said, hey, can so-and-so, I want him. Done deal. He's yours. He hired him that, 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 like that day. 
So forming relationships in that way is really, really important. You got to make connections in that realm. Yeah, because you won't be seen if you don't have someone, you know, that's just the rule, rule of the game. You have to make sure that you are, you have to know the people. And, and even if you don't have that network to begin with, if you put yourself out there soon enough, you'll see that continue building. Maybe that person may not be able to help you, but they know a coach that might be able to help you or may have the time to help you. And I think, you know, sometimes coaches get so obsessed, like you said, with the end result, even with their own career, they want to be the best of the best top this, that they get lost and you need to kind of go through the trenches. Yeah. Um, a common quote that our students hear, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. It's true. You have to, be, you know, oftentimes when we are doing these interviews, the masterclasses, the podcasts, we're talking to these industry leaders, but what we don't realize is how much work went in to getting them to where they are. And if you are an ambitious coach to not feel discouraged and thinking that just because you don't have instant success in a year or two, that you're a failure, you got to just keep going and keep going and finding room for improvement and not get discouraged, whether you're young, you're old, female, male, doesn't really matter. If you're passionate about it, you can find the way. And, you know, if you keep working at it, it's inevitable. If you keep putting in the work, success is inevitable. Yeah, um, 27 years. I had a volunteer. He's, I have a, a volunteer once. He volunteered for me for almost two years unpaid. Two years. And he was at every single workout. We were doing strongman on Friday. So because you're at 5 a.m. He had the whole thing like set up before I even got there. I mean, he was a, for two years. He volunteered for me. And he's a head strength coach now. That's what sometimes you have to do that. You know, sometimes you do have to put in the work without being paid. Just like with uh, the advice we give with PTs, your families are going to be your first contact, uh, your clients. You're going to have to put in some free work. You're going to have to do some internships unpaid. Those are just the types of things you're going to have to do for the value of building those connections and building a reputation of showing your true passion. So I think that's a wonderful piece of advice and hopefully inspire some of our coaches that are listening today. Um, one of the key things that we touched on was the importance of education. Now, Clean Health has a special announcement for our students joining us today. We are providing all of our students who joined our masterclass an exclusive offer for the PPT certific complete certification. Now, again, as Preston said, and if you guys have joined previous masterclasses, education is the core of everything. And the more you know, the more power you get to becoming the best coach that you can be and standing out amongst the rest. So make sure you guys keep a lookout in your emails to get the exclusive offer um, that's going to be sent out as soon as this masterclass is over. As well as if you want to watch the replay of our masterclass, make sure you go check out our YouTube channel because that is where it's going to be posted. Preston and I did create some epic pieces of content and I'm telling you, each one is a gem and I'm not just trying to hype it up. I myself learned a lot from Preston in that short amount of time just to create that for you guys. And I know it's, it's priceless. So make sure you go follow and subscribe to our YouTube channel because we provide endless free education and make sure you head over to our Facebook student group. So going to the Clean Health Facebook page, join our student group. Again, we have exclusive information there from our JV partners, from our educators, exclusive offers just for our students. And I hope that you guys took away some you know, priceless knowledge here. And again, the topics we covered today, we haven't really covered with Clean Health and Preston. You are the king of all these things. And I think that you know the, the lessons I learned even just by moderating these things are things that I take with me to apply to my clients. And I hope that we can, you know, continue working together and continue learning more and more. And, you know, I hate to say this, but like picking your brain at these things, because you may be a mentor to, you know, some of the coaches that are listening and they may know about you, regardless if you have Instagram or not, right? Um, with the, the amount of knowledge you do carry, I think it's the type of thing that is, you know, inspiring to these coaches. And I hope that everyone who joined us enjoyed it. Preston, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank and you. I, hope, I hope you have a killer season this year. Um, I'm not going to cheer against University of Miami, but, you know, I hope you have a great season. And to everyone who joined us, again, recording will be posted later this week. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody.